Without a family, it's like nobody's there for you. Because if nobody's caring for you and you really don't care about anybody, you're mostly going to be depressed. I want my children to learn that there's more to life than what you see. It really is about what you have in here uh, based on your relationship to your, your, your mother and your father. People who want to see you do better and they want you like to have a life better than theirs. Closeness, trust, stability, many things that I'm willing to make sure happens today for my family. When we are bound together by a great aim, our ideals can have enormous power for the good of all. I think more than anything else, Jim Casey was a believer in the idea of opportunity. He created a family of foundations. Annie E. Casey, Casey Family Programs, Marguerite Casey, Jim Casey Youth Opportunities, and Casey Family Services, all of which stem from one man's legacy of love and of giving, which says, I want to make a difference in this world. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? amen. And to our children, amen, amen. the heritage. My mother originally was a foster parent for Casey, and I felt that was a good way to give back. I'm doing pretty good here. I have seven. My name is Sonia Merrill. I'm an ordained elder in the AME Church. When I first got them, Shakoya was three, Patricia was two, and Seema was four months old. Their mother was in a drug rehab and they were only going to be with me until she completed the rehab. Well, that didn't occur. She kept relapsing. That's a... Uh, Rock and roll. Thank you. <laughs> See, that's why I saved my money. A week after the girls came into our home, my husband left. I was afraid that being a single parent, that I could not meet their needs. So I told Casey I, I would try they told me whatever I needed to take care of them, they would be there for me. Casey was able to provide me with the resource persons that were tailored to each one of the girls' needs. You go, Patty. So I knew then, whatever it took, that we could do it if we pulled together. Direct Services gives our work and our advocacy and our vision on behalf of families and kids a kind of grounding in reality. Jim Casey, from the beginning, knew that we're just not talking about abstractions, we're talking about real kids who are in trouble. In the next 15 years, if nothing changes in America, 14 million children will be confirmed as victims of child abuse and neglect. Nine million more children will experience foster care, and the 300,000 young adults will walk out of foster care into adulthood, most of them not prepared to be successful and stable as adults in this life. Here's Moochie. Merry Christmas, Koya. They were sweet little girls. Merry Christmas, Patty. Patricia was the one that I had concerns for because she did not socialize, and she would pull her braids out from the roots. Koya was the jolly, happy-go-lucky one, but we later discovered there were some possible molestation that had taken place. Seema was a preemie, and she also had drugs in her system. But um, she did everything they said she wouldn't do. She started walking at seven months old, and she started talking fluently at 10. And she's just bloomed. Once I found out that I was eligible to adopt them, I figured if I had done it this long, <laughs> they were mine. Can you tell them what's getting ready to happen with you guys? I know. We're getting what is ready mommy to getting be ready adopted. To... Yeah. And we're gonna also get our name, our last Chain. name changed. Can you spell it? M E R R I L L. Boy, that sounded like a chorus. It's not enough just to get a kid safe temporarily. It's only enough 
if we get a kid a family permanently. Permanency is about how do we communicate this sense of love, hope, and compassion that says, I'm going to be here with you as long as you need me to be here with you, and you can trust me. We need to help our children understand how valuable they are. We need to build their confidence and teach them to feel good about themselves. My goals and dreams for them are that they would achieve everything possible within their grasp. I want to be a cook, well, a chef. I want to open my own restaurant. I could have a good job and create different things. First thing I want to make is a phone that can curl your hair for girls only. Math is my strongest subject, so I'm looking forward to being a math teacher. If they keep that same tenacity throughout their life, they could do anything. You know, I tell them, you mess up, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to love you any less, so go for it. I think Jim's own life predicts the direction that he gave to his later philanthropy. Annie and Henry Casey were married in Chicago in 1887. In 1888, Jim was born. They moved to Seattle. It was Henry's intention then to go up to the Yukon, to the gold rush, and make his fortune up there. The ship was shipwrecked. Henry never really recovered and ultimately died in 1902. Jim was just barely a teenager, and his mother had to take care of the family. Jim, his two brothers, and his sister. And Jim had to drop out of school and, and start working and that's when he first got into the delivery business and started the company that became United Parcel Service. The best service for the lowest price, I think, was their slogan. They delivered anything from packages and telephone messages to pitchers of beer to people staying in hotels. And they did whatever people wanted them to do. And it was a hard time, but the family pulled together. And I think you never forget those kind of experiences in your life. And it made Jim uh, sensitive to others who had problems. He had accumulated wealth beyond his need. He started thinking about how should I give my money away to help people. His vision was to find a way to use that wealth to try to extend to kids at risk in this country. And that's where the initial emphasis on strengthening foster care came from in Jim Casey's vision. He talks about the necessity of all of us in society to take care of one another because our futures are linked. And I think the word innovation is at the core of both what happened in UPS and what has happened on the philanthropic side. In 1948, Jim Casey and his siblings formed a foundation, named that foundation in honor of their mother, Annie E. Casey, and committed it to strengthening families and serving disadvantaged kids. No one of us can do very much alone, but united with others for an agreed purpose, we can move forward undaunted by the problems we will meet on the way. So who taught you how to play football? I learned. My name is Dave Gillen. I'm 29 years old. I'm a proud father of two. I work at an agency that works with children and families at risk. I also have a part-time DJ service and recording studio. I was born and raised in the South Bronx. My parents were divorced. My mom was heavily into drugs and alcohol. She passed away when I was eight of a drug overdose. And my father came to take care of my older brother and I. And my father was a cool guy. He was really for his kids. He passed away when I was 13. 
You know, I had a lot of difficulties dealing with the whole death of my mom and my father. It's like, what do you do after that? Everybody around me is dying. I feel deserted. Our life got I wanted them to hear that I missed them. That I loved them. And then I'm gonna make better decisions because that's what they wanted for me to do. My brother took me to Connecticut to get me out the Bronx because he knew the only way we were gonna go was jail or dead. We were in the shelter in Greenwich, so we ended up staying in there for about three months. Eventually, I moved in with this family who had another foster child there at the time, and um, everything seemed okay. I got into high school, I started playing sports. After about a year, it became rough there. It became, you have to do, do this with the family. This is your family. You have to do this, you have to do this. I, I couldn't love anybody. You know, the people I loved the most left me. I didn't trust anybody. They're not yet fully adult and fully self-sufficient. And when they don't have a family to lean on, they become among the most vulnerable. And eventually I moved into this other home. It was the best place I've ever been in. I did things with them and they made me feel like a fam. They made me feel like a part of their family. And I didn't feel like I was forced into it. And eventually I graduated high school, which was a very big deal to me. And they helped me get into a two year college. Casey was, was helping me while I was in college, my first two years in college. They helped me with my books, some of the bills, um, tuition, stuff like that. I started pursuing music. I started uh, performing in clubs, opening up for artists, writing more. I started working on an album, a, a little you know, independent album I was just putting out for fun. Good job, David. Whoa. I learned a lot about family with Janet. She's taught me a lot about sticking by each other no matter what and family don't leave each other, no matter what. Nice throw. You are getting better and better. Up the spin. You got it, good job. My name is Wanda Chambers. I grew up in Harlem. Me and my sister grew up in foster care. I was really little, but I remember. I was an addict, but I stayed clean my daughter's pregnancy. But as soon as she came home, I wanted to use. And she was removed because of that. I was arrested, and she went into care. There are today about 540,000 children in foster care. We might be able to export our learning about what makes a difference, what practices are more effective, where we can send teams in to work with state systems, become partners with public agencies that are trying to reinvent themselves, even in a big, complicated public system. The fact of the matter is, we here in New York City, we've seen over and over again that large systems can in fact change and can do better in terms of making sure that children have good families. I was lucky that they stepped in. I was lucky. I was this bitter addict who felt like, oh, who the heck are you to take my daughter from me? So um, they sentenced me to a three and a half to seven, and I did like um, 29 months, and they let me out on parole. I hadn't seen her since she was months old. When I first saw her again, she was already like in preschool, walking, talking, eating on her own, potty trained and everything. She didn't know who I was, not at all. She's a good girl. She is. Yeah. You let her get away with the murder. No, no, no. I don't let her get away no, with the murder. Rafaela um, Ortiz was my daughter's foster mother. Of course, this woman loved her like her own. I got her when she got two months. Until she turned four years. Wow. I feel bad when I got to bring her to the mother because she's like my daughter. It was obvious the serious connection between her and my daughter. <laughs> Not listening. So if you can't beat them, you join them. <laughs> and then she called me. I come to her house, I visit her, we were friends, like family. We like family now. So we raise her together now, and it's okay. She calls her mama, and she calls me mom. And I'm, and I'm perfectly fine with it. I just love her to death for having loved my daughter when I didn't give a damn about her. My mom can't 
don't you see? I can't tell you how many great families I've met in this work who were very troubled two, three years ago. And they're not out of the woods, but they're strong and they have supports. We have a long ways to go, but when you see a big system like this start to turn, it's really a remarkable thing. Did you fill out the, app, the Section 8 application? I, know you I was in um, preventive services. I can remember telling my preventive worker, I want to work helping other parents that have been through the system and been going through all this stuff that I'm going through. And um, she's like, Wanda, ACS is hiring for parent advocates. Send your resume. I was like, get out. You'll get some type of results today, I'm sure. And they hired me full time. I'm going into my second year there. And nobody never called me back. Call me again. I love my job. Seeing people move forward, I get a real joy out of that, knowing that if I said one little thing, if that helped them in some kind of way, I'm happy with that. I just wanted what everybody else, quote unquote, normal had, to work, have a home, and my family, and I have that now. You must keep regular track of what you're accomplishing. How are the children and their families doing? Without measurement, you really don't know what works. And unless you know what works, you can't be an effective change agent on behalf of any mission. We want to know how many kids we're really helping. We want to know if the work we're doing is having the impact that it should have. We want to know if it's uh, going to be long lasting and can be replicated. This is a tool that makes charity more powerful than just its impulse and its good intentions. First is the dream, then development followed by improvement until the dream becomes a reality. He was way ahead of his time. He believed in research and study to make sure that the best possible approaches were being used. If the outcomes aren't right, we can't keep doing the same thing. I don't want to get to a 25-year period and find myself painted in the corner. I think, oops, will not do. So we got to make sure that we're measuring and evaluating our work and recalibrating our strategy. ability to dream that you can do better and that your children will be, do better, I think it's a great inspirational force. Five years ago, I think White Center was a matter of hopes and dreams, and now it's a community that's transforming before our eyes. People in White Center come from all over the world. At least 20 different cultures and languages. My parents came here in the late 50s from Samoa. I'm Sili Sabusa. My husband and I live in White Center and I have three children. White Center has been known traditionally as this low-income neighborhood. People used to call it up there in Rat City, up there in Ghettoville in West Seattle. It's a very scary situation when you walk out your shop door and there's prostitutes walking up and down and there's druggies, you know, all over. What happens to kids depends in lots of ways on the strength of their family. And the strength of families in this country depends on the community in which those families are trying to raise their children. You can't just concentrate on the kids because if their families aren't secure and safe and successful, the kids won't be either. You can't do this kind of change for somebody. You can only do it with communities. This is not noblesse oblige coming to sort of bail somebody out. This is really trying to forge partnerships with families and with communities. When the Casey Foundation came to town five years ago, they said that they wanted to meet and talk about their work and how they're going to be here for 10 years. There was this meeting that was held. There were close to 300 people there. The community identified these four areas as priorities to White Center. Housing, schools, we wanted jobs, and then we wanted to make sure that families had support. 
that you have to bring out the ability of families to take care of themselves. That's the importance of allowing opportunities for leadership for those folks that we don't recognize often as leaders. You know, they were just asking me about the work. Out of that initial meeting came this notion of these leaders and the phrase was coined as trusted advocates to the community. And so that just caught. In Spanish, we, we say mis respetos because it's like my respect to them because they are a big force in the community. I need to try to finalize that letter from the trusted advocates for the steering committee to... It's rare to get a chance to sit at a table with the president of United Way, the superintendent of the school district, or a Boeing vice president. And many times, a lot of the struggles that institutions have in best meeting the needs of families is because they're so far removed from these communities. So that was the hook for me. There's a definite feeling and sense of pride in the neighborhood itself. You find people now are actually buying and staying in this area. This is a nice place to live. In nearly a quarter of a century, as I've watched the ups and downs of White Center, right now I see more promise than I've ever seen in my career. This is the whole project. Working with the foundation, it's really benefited me personally. For my children to see me interact with institutions that way and build relationships cross-culturally is invaluable. It actually goes back to a value that my father had, that it's not about you, that your life is about giving back. So I just learned really early in life that, <clears throat> that what I do um, on behalf of, um, you know, even my own brother and sister, I do on behalf of, of a collective of people. I heard about the history of Jim Casey and how he had this vision to deliver packages. If he only could see the kind of impact that he had through that vision of his, I don't even know what words to say, but it's, it's magical, it really is.